and welcome to this episode of our Analyst Angle series. I'm your host, Shelley Kramer, Managing Director and Principal Analyst here at the Cube Research. And today I'm joined by Matt Clark, who's the CEO and President of CoreCentric. And our conversation today is going to be centered on how CFOs can remove friction in B2B commerce, help reduce the cost of doing business, and also helping manage control costs. And that's what we like to affectionately call the ultimate challenge. Hey, Matt, it's great to have you. Thanks for having me, Shelley. Absolutely. I'm so I'm so looking forward to this conversation. So that ultimate challenge business. This is part of really just about any digital transformation journey, which is to me, and it's always been, you know, about the, the combination, the magic combination of people, processes, and technology, which is exactly what we're talking about here. And this magic combination can be a significant driver of business growth and agility, and that's pretty much what every organization seeks. So let's get real though, back office tasks like accounts payable, accounts receivable, you know, just saying those things make me kind of want to groan because they're <laughs> some, they are sometimes such arduous parts of doing business. And I know that you all, you're, you're laughing, Matt, but our audience certainly knows what I mean, right? So, but these, these things include paper checks and invoices that need scanning and procurement and the million little details that are a part of procurement operations. And these are an onerous but critical part of business operations. Um, the reality, however, though, is that today these tasks don't need to be quite so challenging and and even more compelling to me um, is about thinking about this transformation is that by optimizing costs, organizations can position themselves to leverage what can I think can be a pretty significant competitive advantage. They can spur growth, innovation, and even business resilience. So, and, and uh, the icing on the cake there is that by embracing this kind of transformation initiative, you can also make employees and customers happy in the process. So to me, that's really a, a winning combination. So with that background, Matt, let's dive in. You ready? Sounds good. All right. So we're in an age where CFOs and finance and procurement pros are tasked with doing more with less. And I know that you and your team are elbows deep in all things back office and procurement. I think that, you know, I, I think I noticed that core centric process is something like 20 plus million transactions annually and more than 150 billion in spend that's processed, that's not no small, those are no small numbers. So can you share a bit with me about the trends that you're seeing play out across the industry, Matt? Yeah, for sure. And I think you, you know, you really touched on on one of those, which is just kind of the recognition of you know what organizations need to do from a people process and technology perspective to get the outcomes that they've struggled to get historically. And so I see it. A really large trend uh, in the changing role of the, the CFO. So, uh, the CFO role, in in my view, and what I've seen in the marketplace, has evolved uh, quite significantly in the last few years. And really, CFOs are being tasked with becoming that driver of organizational growth and strategic initiatives, and especially strategic initiatives around finance, procurement, and technology. And really, are becoming the kind of leaders from a digital transformation perspective. So where historically, you know, maybe digital uh, transformation fell with a an IT, an IT leader, a CIO, a CTO, you know, what we're seeing now is that really is falling at the feet of the CFO. And I think it's for some very specific reasons. I think the, I think the missteps of the past, we'll call them, you know, have led to this where it's been you know, attacking acute problems with acute solutions and really being kind of reactive versus proactive. And what that's manifested itself into is, you know, companies that have, you know, uh, engaged with solution providers against this entire spectrum of, of finance and procurement have point solutions that they're, you know, taking the burden of stitching together from a process flow and a data flow continuity perspective. And I think the realization has taken place in the marketplace that that is not the way to achieve in, in quick fashion what these organizations are looking to achieve and help them deal with the challenges of, of today. So it's really this, you know, kind of combination of the, the challenging macroeconomic conditions, um, you know, the, the recognition that solving, you know, uh, acute problems with acute solutions is not, the, is not the way to address this. And so I feel like, you know, this role change for the CFO is a direct result of that and leading to organizations taking a much more holistic view from a people process and technology perspective to say, 
what is that right combination of those three elements that are going to get us further fastest? You know, I've spent, uh, in addition to being a tech analyst, I've spent the vast part of my career as a marketing brand strategist. And a lot of my work has been in working alongside my enterprise customers as they are navigating their digital transformation journeys. And I think one of the key things that I think is so important here is that, um, that finding and working with trusted vendor partners and, and, you know, whether it's for procurement and payment solutions, you know, back office solutions and that sort of thing or something else. But, but when you're working with a trusted vendor partner who can bring best in class technology solutions, experience, expertise that they bring from relationships with other customers, um, it shortens the learning curve. It shortens the ROI part of the equation. Totally. And, and I think that, you know, what's important to me and, and I will also say that, you know, I'm old enough to have, you know, started out at the bottom of a career ladder and navigated my way up. And as a leader today, what I want to spend my time doing, I want to spend my time doing the things that bring deep core value to the business. You know, I don't want to be messing with little details or, you know, those things that I groaned about early in the conversation. So I think really the beauty of the right technology solutions and the right vendor partnerships mean that organizations and leaders within organizations can focus on those core competencies and then better serve their end customers. I'm not thinking you would disagree with me on that one. No, I wouldn't disagree at all. And I would, you know, I'd build on that actually to say that, you know, I think the, you know, the trust is is a huge part of it. But one of the things you touched on was just kind of having that ability, you know, we're out there in the marketplace, we're seeing what's working and probably more importantly, what's not working for, right. for companies that are trying to address the same challenges. And if you're sitting within a particular company, you don't have that kind of broader view of what's out there in the marketplace, what's right. real and what's not, and what is going to get them, you know, to the outcomes. Uh, that they're that they're seeking. And I think the other, you know, the other angle there is also something that that you had touched on, which is, you know, when companies are looking at, you know, tackling these these challenges, often what we're talking to companies about is, you know, let's be real about what your core competencies are as a business. So if you're a yeah. manufacturing company, your core competency is manufacturing whatever <laughs> products you, you know, you create and you build. Yeah. You know, some of this back office, the AP, the AR, the procurement stuff, you know, it's almost viewed within organizations as somewhat of a necessary evil. And so when yeah. things are viewed as kind of a necessary evil, it's like, oh, well, it is what it is. I guess we just have to live with it. And so part of that journey is basically getting those those companies and those leaders to step outside and say, you know, this isn't a core competency for us, but it is for a solution provider like CoreCentric. How can we marry our two, you know, efforts together to have folks that, you know, view, you know, things like, invoice processing and procurement and AR as a core competency to be applied to our business so that we can, again, get further faster. Yeah, I agree. And I think to me, that's one of the big benefits of the, you know, the evolution of tech solutions that we've seen over the course of the last decade plus is that, you know, you don't have no longer do you have to, you know, have a business that approach this things with a siloed mindset and that we have to build and do everything ourselves. And, you know, and, and it was having this conversation with, um, with some engineers recently and and they were talking about you know let's get real the the reality of it is is that we're engineers we like to build stuff but you know what what we're realizing is that sometimes building it ourselves is actually not the best solution so i think right. some of that plays a role in here too so matt i'd love to know a little bit more about the industries that core centric serves yeah, so I'd say from a from a broader perspective, you know, as as you can imagine, we're we're sitting in the middle of B two B commerce, and so you know, we always um, you know we always say around uh, around our company here, you know, kind of the the more complex, the the messier, the better. You know, there's a bigger opportunity to make uh, really step change impacts to our customers. So some of the industries where you see that, you know, kind of those kind of dynamics, you know, uh, high number, high volume number of uh, trading partners, high volume numbers of transactions, a lot of complexity around how you know a buyer and a seller want to transact from a purchase order invoice perspective, but also from a payment timing and a payment modality uh, perspective. So you know where we have seen you know some of those conditions you know uh, existing would be you know our heritage was in transportation and logistics. You know we really created 
uh, a two-sided network in that industry. And then we took a lot of those principles and started to look to other industries that that looked a lot like transportation and logistics from that kind of complexity perspective. So a natural uh, natural adjacency from a kind of manufacturing and distribution perspective. Sure. Uh, certainly, as as probably everybody knows, you know, a lot of complexity and a lot of room for improvement in healthcare and pharmaceutical space. And then one that might not be top of mind for folks from kind of a B2B commerce perspective is, is the food and beverage sector. So that's you know, anywhere from, you know, distribution efforts in the food and in beverage se- sector, but also things like, you know, quick serve restaurants where you have lots of geographically uh, spread out locations, lots of trading partners in terms of who they're, you know, buying their goods and services from. And so, again, coming into these industries, establishing value on both sides, uh, you know, these are some of the industries where we've seen ourselves be able to make kind of the biggest impacts. Awesome. Uh, th- th- none of this surprised me except food and beverage. So I appreciate, <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that explanation. So, you know, I know that you're out there, you know, having conversations, whether it's internally with your customers, with prospective customers, but I know that you really have your finger on the on the pulse of what challenges your customers, what are the biggest challenges your customers are facing today? Will you like, you know, share some of those challenges with me? Yeah, for sure. So I think, you know, the the challenges are, are are much higher pitched in today's environment, and you know, it's probably self evident with some of the kind of macro uh, conditions that are 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 being faced on a on a daily basis in in any kind of industry or sector. And some of those, you know, bigger themes would be around you know just you know uh, capital strategy and you know how people are adjusting and adapting to a different interest rate environment that we, we've been used to uh, yeah. in the recent history. Uh, you know, adjusting and uh, managing around uh, things like inflation, uh, and then there's some other things in terms of kind of resource uh, challenges. If you think about some of the you know back office areas that we impact, you know, pretty much on a dime globally, we went from you know, a very kind of, you know, traditionally uh, office-based environment for those types of resources. And then all of a sudden companies had, you know, hundreds or thousands of micro offices all over the place uh, when things shifted more to kind of a a remote work situation. And that creates a lot of, you know, a lot of challenges in terms of, you know, retention of employees, you know, the growth and development of employees, but just kind of the day-to-day execution of tasks. So, you know, really, uh, those are some of the bigger, more kind of, you know, macro challenges that are being faced by businesses. And then when you kind of double click inside of that, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of discussion and a lot of talk around, you know, data protection, data continuity, uh, data privacy, tons going on globally around, you know, compliance and different rules and regulations that are being rolled out on a global basis. So those things are all, you know, large challenges uh, for companies. You know, not just securing your data, uh, not just, um, you know, being compliant, but being able to take your data and turn it into information. It's always it's almost become a situation where, you know, as a society, we're almost in data overload and we have more data than we know what to do with it. And so that ability to take data and turn it into information is a really large challenge for for companies uh, to to tackle. You know, I just finished a research study on that very topic, and that's one of the most pressing problems that people have is, you know, we we are inundated by data and being able to take that data and glean insights from it that can help drive business decisions. That's on everybody's radar screens these days. So I'm not surprised by that. So talk with me a little bit about some of the ways that you and the team at CoreCentric are helping navigate these challenges. Yeah, great question. So I think, you know, the way the way we've kind of looked at things is, you know, part of our whole kind of mission statement as a company is really, you know, a desire to meet our customers where they're at, you know, in in this very complex world we're living in, especially in this complex kind of B2B commerce world we're living in, you know, a cookie cutter approach doesn't work, a one size fits all approach doesn't work. But, you know, looking at it from a kind of tailor-made solution uh, design mindset, you know, to really serve the customer's needs both now and in the future. And I think that's a really important piece of the puzzle here. It's, yeah. you know, in a lot of cases we're you know, trying, trying to solve for the here and now, which is absolutely important. And if something's being surfaced as a, you know, an urgent need and an urgent challenge that needs to be addressed, 
certainly we want to work hand in hand with our customers to do that. But we also want to be keeping one eye on the horizon and on the future and say, let's make sure the decisions that we're making today don't put us in a box that's not going to allow us to continue to you know, grow and evolve and optimize uh, down the road. So it's that concept of you know, not taking that cookie cutter approach, meeting our customers where we're at, you know, addressing the here and now, but then keeping an eye on, on the future. And then the other thing I would point out um, that we view as part of our special sauce is, is really kind of the people element to it. So certainly our, our charge is to uh, deliver great technology uh, and software solutions to our customers to support the key workflows that we're trying to impact but also complementing that with uh, managed and advisory services so that we can help augment and supplement uh, what our customers doing themselves, but also so that we can get speed to value quicker. And that's really what our goal is. We wanna make sure that we are setting up a situation where our customers are achieving that value and that ROI as quickly as they possibly can. And often yeah. see where you know, folks just take kind of a software only Mindset, it's okay, this software, once I implement it, it's going to solve all my problems. But there's typically kind of an under appreciation <laughs> for some of the kind of, you know, people elements and change management elements that surround, you know, making these step change yeah. improvements to what these companies are doing on a day to day basis. Yeah. Well, I'm smiling because as I've walked this path so many times it, over the course of my career. And, um, you know, I am all in on the services component of any offering. And I have made decisions about expensive uh, additions to a tech stack and, you know, made those decisions only to realize, oh my gosh, now I'm going to have to hire a consultant to help me deploy this because I don't have anybody internally who has this skill set. Right. And that's often not a part of the conversation that you have with a vendor. So I'm always looking for, I'm never going to make a purchase without having a conversation about what kind of support um, can I expect? What kind of managed services can I raise my hand and opt in for? And, you know, the, the reality of it is, is that you you touched on it. Time to value is so important. And, you know, yeah. fooling around trying to figure this out myself when I'm not an expert at this technology is not the path that I want to take. So I, I really like that that's an important part of your solution offerings. I think that's really important. So I mentioned earlier that I believe that um, Embracing cost optimization and empowering that frictionless B2B commerce that we've been talking about can actually, I, I truly believe it can be a significant competitive advantage for organizations. Do you see that happening across the industries and the customers that you serve? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, see it from a couple different dimensions. I'd say, you know, one of the things we often talk to customers about is, you know, don't be a victim of your success. And what does that mean? So when companies are, you know, growing and scaling and they're really focused typically uh, and rightfully so, you know, focused on, you know, how we're going to grow our business, how we're going to grow it faster and at a higher pitch. But often what happens is companies wait way too long to do the things around the processes we're talking about here today to be able to efficiently and effectively scale. And so they find themselves, as I mentioned before, becoming a victim of their own success or you know, not being able to deal with the challenges that come with growth, growth and scaling. So the companies that are thinking not about where they are today, but about where they want to be, you know, a year from now, two years from now, three to five years from now, you know, gives that right mindset to say, yeah, we might be getting by today with some of our back office pro processes, with some of our payment strategies, whether how we're getting paid or how we're paying our suppliers. Uh, but to map that out and to look again over the horizon and say, you know, what is this going to look like when we're twice the size as we are today and starting to move in that direction doesn't have to ha have to happen overnight. But where I see, you know, it'd be a competitive advantage is really the companies that are thinking in that fashion, you know, are able to grow and scale in an efficient and effective manner where they're not, you know, having to add, you know, expense base, you know, add to the expense base in the same way that they're adding to the, you know, the, the revenue base. Right. I say another, uh, you know, real kind of competitive advantage from embracing, you know, this frictionless B2B commerce comes from, you know, just capital strategy. You know, how much of your capital, your working capital is locked up in your AP and your AR processes? What is that manifesting itself in, in terms of your ability to predictably understand what your cash flow position is so that you can make strategic moves based off of predictability around, you know, cash flow uh, outcomes and working capital outcomes? And so, 
those are where you see really, really big uh, advantages, competitive advantages being realized where companies, you take a supplier, for example, that you know might be leveraging our AR solution where they know with 100% pre predictability with, when they're going to get paid. They can now earmark you know, their AR dollars knowing when they're going to come in and hit their bank account and start to make strategic investments. If you're a manufacturing company and you're trying to build a new manufacturing plant, can you leverage, you know, freed up uh, AR and, and more predictability around your AR as a piece of your capital strategy so that you're not having to rely on, you know, some of the high interest uh, capital instruments uh, that are out there in the world today. So that becomes an extremely competitive advantage when it comes to you know, your capital strategy and how you can deploy that capital in a more strategic fashion. Well, and I think the way that I look at it sometimes is that I I know many CFOs and sometimes it can be a little bit, it can be, feel like you're on an island. Um, and I, I think that when I hear you talking about some of the capabilities and the services that you provide is some of, you know, what comes to mind is that I kind of feel like, you know, I have somebody as a CFO to walk this journey with me. And, and I look at your strategic advisory services as a little bit like that. Um, what do you think about that? That's a great way to, uh, you know, took the words right out of my mouth. That's a great way to think about it, you know, walking that journey with you. And that journey starts even before you know our customers are customers, it's really when they're you know when they're prospects and we're working on shaping what an engagement could look like. And we get you know our advisory services involved you know very early in the process to really say, let's diagnose before we prescribe. Let's not yeah. come in with some preconceived notion about you know what's going to move the needle most uh, with this particular scenario. You know, going back to meeting our customers where we're at. So from the very beginning of that journey to say, okay. You know, let's let's diagnose before we prescribe. Let's put forth our recommendations that are best ba based on best practices and based on experiences we've had with other other customers of ours. And it continues through that life cycle. So once we get into implementation, you know, let's make sure you know we're managing change management, you know, in a way that's going to allow the customer to get that speed to value. And then even after they're you know even after they're up and running on our solution you know, staying attached to that customer through that journey to say, okay, make sure you're getting the value that you intended to get out of the solution that you originally engaged with us on. But then, okay, now that we've solved for that pain point or that challenge or that optimization effort, what's the next thing that we can sequence here that'll continue yeah. moving you in that direction to get to be, you know, best in class across the board? So it's a very consultative arrangement. I like that. And, you know, I, I will say one of the things that I've always told my clients over the years is that I'm in the business of winning. And so if I come into our relationship and sell you something just for the sake of selling you something, that's not winning. Um, you know, what, what is winning, however, is, as you said, if we work together to diagnose the challenges and the problems and come up with the solution or solutions that make sense and the, the advisory that is part of that and all of that sort of thing, together we're on this journey and together we win. Because if I sell you something to sell you something and you don't realize some amazing benefits from it, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to sell that kind of stuff. So I like hearing this. Yeah, and it's something that we feel you know very strongly about. And I'd say one more thing I'd add to that is just always thinking with that end in mind. Um, yeah. Again, you might not action everything that's going to get you to that, you know, that, you know, that uh, utopian state, that North Star that you're setting for yourselves and that yeah. we can work with you to set for yourselves. But always thinking with that end in mind and saying, Okay, what is it we're doing and how does that how is this getting us, you know, further faster towards that that end goal yeah. that we've set out to achieve? Yeah, absolutely. So I would love to know, Matt, about I about any customer use cases that you might be willing to share with me that would help illustrate some of the results that core center clients are seeing. Yeah, I think uh, you know, touching on, you know, kind of three uh, use cases that kind of span uh, a good bit of of what we do and how we engage with our customers, you know, would be helpful, you know, kind of color for folks. So, you know, I'd start on our our AR solution. So again, you know, that solution is really all about, you know, a turnkey solution that allows, you know, companies to really optimize their entire, you know, AR world uh, from the receipt of purchase orders to the invoices that go out to their customers to how payments, uh, payment timing and payment modality is managed. And, you know, what you get, you know, in the in the AR space today is, you know, if, if a company has a thousand customers, you might have a thousand different ways in which those customers want to 
you know, submit orders to you, get invoiced, uh, pay. Uh, so you get this level of complexity that's just uh, un, un, unsustainable, I guess is what I would call it. And so, you know, we've worked with uh, a company in the manufacturer, a large, you know, tire manufacturer um, that was really looking to solve for that problem there. And we sit between them and their very diverse customer base, different sizes, different levels of sophistication, and really turnkey a solution where we're able to, again, cover that entire AR lifecycle in a way that's that's better than they've been able to historically managing it on their own and generating guaranteed outcomes for them where they're able to fix you know, DSO to a certain day and say, okay, if my payment terms are 30 days, I'm gonna get paid on day 30 by CoreCentric on time, every time without deduction, CoreCentric's going to swivel chair and figure out all the noise on the other side of my ecosystem here, how my customers need to be transacting with us, you know, how they're going to pay, uh, both from a timing and modality perspective. And so been a total game changer for this, you know, tire manufacturer in the way that they're able to manage their strategic accounts. And these are large, you know, large strategic customers, think like FedEx, Walmart, um, oh, yeah. you know, Amazon you know, have very complex processes when it comes to doing business with them. And we basically create that easy button for our customers with those predictable outcomes. And with this particular customer in, in a more specific sense of being able to remove all that friction and give them the predictable outcomes that our AR solution, you know, delivers. Flip it to the other side of the equation, you know, look, working with a very large uh, energy company uh, around all of their uh, activity with their supply base. So you're now flipping it to the other side of the equation from a B2B commerce perspective and saying, right. how can we optimize how you're paying your suppliers? So 3,700 active suppliers that this company has to deal with on a regular basis, you know, almost 540 million of spend uh, in their spend portfolio that's been shifted to a revenue generating payment construct, a, a virtual card payment construct that not only gives them efficiency, but also allows them to generate real dollars from their AP activity. So big, big story there around yeah. scale, uh, efficiency and, and, and positive outcomes for uh, a very large energy company. And then the last one I'll touch on is a, you know, kind of leading chemical distributor, you know, here in the, in the US. And really what we've done for them is address the entire buy side life cycle uh, in terms of, of giving them the, the technology, the people, uh, and the payment capabilities to optimize that. So, you know, being able to help them manage, better manage a billion dollars of global indirect spend, delivering, you know, double digit millions of dollars of savings from doing that, you know, enabling, the, and this starts at the very front end of their you know, kind of source to pay process from, you know, you know, sourcing to procurement all the way through to AP where we're executing uh, payments uh, to their suppliers. So a full end-to-end -end solution with technology, managed and advisory services wrapped around it, and then our unique and differentiated payment uh, solutions on the back end, getting them you know, to a place they never dreamed they could get to when they were trying to, trying to manage this on their own. Well, I think that, um, that sounds like music to my ears. <laughs> well, Matt, we can't have a conversation today about anything without talking about AI. And I, I think that earlier this year, CoreCentric added some generative AI capabilities to your managed accounts, payable invoice processing. Talk with me a little bit about that, if you would, and what kind of results you're seeing thus far. Yeah, so just broadly from an AI strategy perspective, we're really looking at it, you know, in kind of two dimensions. One is, yeah. you know, how can we you know, leverage AI, you know, leverage RPA machine learning to deliver value directly to our customers through our solutions? But also because we have a managed services component of what we do uh, around our solutions, you know, how can we make our own managed services more efficient and effective from you know, an AI perspective and leveraging you know, latest and greatest technologies? And what you touched on there in terms of from a kind of AP invoice processing really kind of checks both of those boxes in terms yeah. of being able to take you know, maybe uh, invoices that are coming in either via still snail mail, believe it or not, or through you know, PDF images of invoices and take that data and as efficiently as possible, or take those images and as efficiently as possible, you know, extract the metadata and digitize them at the earliest stage possible for, uh, the, you know, for the maximum amount of efficiency and cost savings. And so absent an AI solution, you're looking at you know, a situation where you know, it's a pretty human intensive process to do that yeah. data extraction. and you know, we've built, you know, our own proprietary tool around leveraging AI to be able to, you know, replace human interaction with, 
you know, the ability to digitize invoices in a very effective uh, and efficient manner, both for our customers as well as for ourselves from a managed services perspective. We've also released products around, um, you know, natural language processing. So the ability for customers to simply go into whatever their kind of business, you know, platform is, whether that be Teams or, or any of the other uh, solutions that are out there and simply in natural language, you know, key in props like, hey, what was my spend with this vendor in the last three months and not even having to log into our solution, but our solution delivering, you know, immediate uh, responses to kind of natural language uh, in inquiries. And then extending, you know, what we're doing around a lot of the compliance uh, initiatives that are coming down the pike globally, you know, the importance of being able to not only digitize invoices, whether they be AR or AP invoices in an effective, an effective and efficient manner, but being able to make sure that those that data is being run through the right tools to say, you know, this invoice is compliant and it's ready to be either sent or received or it's not and something needs to be addressed. But doing that in a way that's very AI driven versus, again, you know, uh, leaning on, you know, kind of human interaction to do that. Well, and it's just, it adds so much value across the board and, you know, talking about, you know, the speed by which many of these things can be processed. And, and I think the reality of it is, as we look at our internal teams, you know, what we're now relying on AI solutions to do are parts of jobs that people didn't really love anyway, you know, right. and so yeah. that way we can kind of redirect their efforts on on tasks that add that are not only more in, interesting infinitely more interesting but that add deeper value to the business and so i think that's a win all the way across the board yeah we talk about that all the time both internally yeah. and externally with our customers is like absolutely you know they say where do we go first you know when it comes to looking at how we can leverage ad and i say you know what are the most like <laughs> What are, the, what are the tasks that people you know, hate, the hate doing the most that are the <laughs> least kind of like, you know, value accretive and that's yeah. where you need to start. Right. And uh, to Absolutely. your point, you know, it's not always about saying, OK, if we implement the solution, we're going to be able to get rid of this many heads. Certainly there are right. situations where that's the case. But as important as saying, how can we reallocate these resources to higher value yeah. tasks that are going to deliver more value to the enterprise? Yeah. That's what it's all about. Well, Matt, as we wrap the show, I'm going to ask you two final questions. The first, what differentiates CoreCentric from its competitors in the market? Yeah, so I think we've touched on, um, you know, some of that throughout, but just to put, you know, kind of a finer point on it, I think it's the way in which, you know, we, we always view our secret sauce as that way in which we combine, you know, the people, the process and the technology, yeah. you know, uh, and deploy that to both sides of B2B. So, in a lot of cases, solution providers are, are playing on one side or the other, the buy side or the sell side, and maybe they're only addressing a sliver of that life cycle. So having workflows that support the complete life cycle of you know, procurement AP and AR on, yeah. on, on the, you know, in the construct of B2B commerce is, is a big differentiator. And then taking that, that platform and that, that network effect and applying the you know, the, the, the people and the processes around it to get, you know, maximum value as quickly as possible and staying with those customers throughout that journey. I think that's another yeah. point that we touched on earlier. You know, not, not just doing a drive-by where we're just dropping a piece of technology in your lap and we're on to the yeah. next one. Staying with that customer uh, through that journey and making sure that every step along the way, we're moving in the direction that we both locked arms on moving in in terms of, you know, getting to that best-in-class state. Yeah, I like it. My second and final question, what one piece of advice do you have for CFOs, finance and procurement pros who are looking to, I mean, you know, not everybody's very far along this journey. So for those who might be listening, who are thinking about modernizing and opera, optimizing their finance, financial operations, what one piece of advice do you have for them? Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, one piece of advice that has kind of a couple, uh, couple angles to it, I would say, first and foremost, you got to, you know, you got to separate the kind of attachment to the way it's always been, um, you know, with, you know, solution providers like ourselves that are taking unique and different approaches to, to this world, uh, with the tools and the technologies that are available, you know, I'd say, come into this, you know, journey with an open mind, you know, really thinking holistically, and not thinking in the kind of siloed, fragmented way that has gotten folks into trouble historically that has yeah. led to these situations where people have, you know, stitched together solutions, no data continuity, no process flow continuity. So 
step back, you know, detach from what has been, you know, and look at things holistically and think with the end in mind, like I mentioned earlier, you know, it's not just about the here and now. Uh, the here and now is certainly important, but, you know, really spend the time kind of thinking with that end in mind and then working backwards from that in conjunction with the right solution provider to map out, uh, you know, essentially create a roadmap, you know, from where you are uh, to where you want to be. Yeah. Well, and I think that it is it is a given in most instances that relying on the status quo is really not the best path forward. So, and, you know, and I say this as somebody who I, I'm a change agent. Every relationship that I come into um, is one where my clients are embarking upon change. It's hard, hard. but that, but holding onto that status quo in, in highly competitive, quick moving business times. And then with the advent of AI and generative AI solutions, I mean, you can't, you, there, it's a real, there's a real danger in relying on the status quo today. Yeah. And I, I would, I would add to that, that, you know, there's also this, you know, kind of mindset of, you know, now's not the right time. We've got this going on. We've got that going on. And, you know, what I always say to folks is if now's not the right time, it's not going to get it to be any better time as your business continues to grow yeah. and scale and the challenges get more complex. And so, yeah. you know, it, it always feels kind of, like an easy out to say, uh, you know, maybe we'll kick the can down the road. Maybe we'll address this later. It, it only makes it more difficult. So, you know, the time is now. And I, I don't think there's much that's more important in terms of being able to, you know, build something that's going to help you be a, a sustainable business that's going to be able to grow without, you know, getting stifled and becoming a victim of your own growth. Yeah, I have very salient points. You know, I will share this. Um, I. I was looking at your website when I was preparing for this conversation. And one of the things that really spoke to me was um, the, the leading with values that seems to be kind of baked into CoreCentric's DNA. And, and there's a statement on your website that says, you know, kind of our values. And they're pretty simple. Do the right thing. Embrace and drive change, which is exactly what we've been talking about. Be empowered and be relentlessly focused on the customer. Matt, I would say that based upon the you know conversation that we've had the last 25 or 30 minutes, that's exactly what you and the team at Core Centric are doing. I applaud you. Well, I appreciate that. We try to try to live our core values every single day. We're yeah. talking about them every day. We're recognizing people that are demonstrating those core values every day. And we, yeah. you know, we're proud to talk about them with our, our yeah. customers and our prospects because we truly believe we we live them out. Well, and I think, you know, that is a, a driver of decisions on, you know, who I'm going to work with, what vendors sure. I'm going to work with. So I, I really liked seeing that. As I said, it resonated with me on your website. Matt Clark, President and CEO of CoreCentric, thank you so much for joining me today. CFOs, finance pros, procurement pros, all play an outsized role in business success today. The advice and the insights that you've shared have been incredibly valuable. Really appreciate you making time for me today. To, Thanks, Shelly. Absolutely. And to our viewing and listening audience, I'm your host, Shelly Kramer, Managing Director of Principal Analyst here at the Cube Research. Thanks for joining us here at the Cube, your source for enterprise and emerging tech news. We'll see you next time.